All right, so we are recording, we are live, we are in lecture 37, we only have one more week left. So uh, a couple of things, so first off, there was a question at the beginning of class about the final. The final is gonna be during the university scheduled time uh, for Monday, Wednesday, Friday at 11 classes. And so we drew the slot, that's Tuesday of uh, finals week starting at 10.15. Uh, so it's going to start at 10.15, it's going to close at 12.15, but the final's not going to be of any different format than the previous uh, two exams. So it's going to be just another exam like all the others. Um, and, and we'll do it online on Blackboard like all the others. So um, it'll be the same format, there'll be a, a, a timed portion and then you can upload your PDF calcs later. Um, same, same process. Um, any questions about that? And I've got other stuff I'm going to talk about. Let me make this big. Um, actually, hold on. That didn't work. Bear with me. Any questions? I need to change that to that one. Okay, so um, you probably see here on the slide that uh, we're going to have a pre-recorded lecture on Monday. I have a meeting on Monday that that uh, I can't avoid. So what we're going to do is this. Um, uh, I have actually already recorded the lecture for Monday. Um, basically, what we're going to do is uh, today we're going to do our first discreetly braced design uh, example. Discreetly braced, uh, bleh, discreetly braced beam design example. Ooh, that's a that's a tongue twister. Um, and that one is going to be focused on a beam that has what's called a, what I'm call what I call a low CB value, um, and then the one that we have uh, the, for the recording is for a high CB value, and the process is exactly the same. The only difference is for high CB values, you you might there's a potential that you have to iterate a little bit more, and um, I, I, th that's really the perfect example to just pre-record. So that way. I can go back and forth uh, on the video with you, and I have it set up to where it's it's uh it's pretty easy to uh, uh, to navigate uh, in the video. Um, what I'm going to do is I'm going to record the lecture, you know, the, the one that we're recording today. That's going to get posted to the YouTube channel, and then I'm going to turn the lecture for um uh, for t uh, for Monday on on the channel as well. And as for homework, so homework 6.5 is due today. That's you know that's due today, so it, you know currently being graded. Um, I'll post the solution I have here that it's posted. I'm going to post it um, sometime later. Uh, and then homework six will be assigned today and it's due Monday. Homework seven will be assigned Monday, due Wednesday, just like we've been doing. Um, so I'll turn on that assignment. It'll turn on Monday at noon, uh, like all the others. Um, and Wednesday, when we come back, we're going to do our final lecture. I have in the notes that we're going to do shear capacity, but shear capacity is actually a really short topic. I actually covered that in the video for Monday. So what we're going to do on Wednesday is we're going to cover something that's been lingering for the uh, for the time that we've discussed columns and beams, and I'm going to discuss local buckling. Um, for rolled W shapes that we've been dealing with, it's incredibly easy to, to handle because we really don't have to handle it. Um, but I want to kind of introduce the topic and... I think the, the nice thing about it is one of the examples I'm going to try and do focuses on a column. And so it'll sort of serve as, as a, uh, an informal review of column equations because that's going to be on the final. And then Friday we'll do our exam review and that'll be it. Uh, any questions? All right. I'm going to post something real big in the chat before we get started. Um, this is the um, uh, the current uh, uh, status on the surveys. So there's the university administered survey, and then there's the course learning outcome survey. Um, for both of those, I've got more people that have done the surveys than have uploaded proof to Blackboard. Um, if uh, if you um, upload the proof again, you'll get bonus points. But if not, I don't know who did the survey or, or not. It doesn't tell me that. Um, if everybody does both surveys, then I'll give credit, you know, across the board. But I've got to have like, you know, full 100% response rate. Then I'll know who all, who all has done it. But just make sure that, that you do. I really do appreciate the feedback. It does help me out uh, a lot. Uh, and I'll be bringing it up, you know, uh, from, you know, between now and the, and the end. Okay, let's go ahead and, and jump right into it. Uh, it's enough on, on announcements. Let's get into some steel design. 
First off, I want to recall the, the flow chart. This is the equations that you use to compute the capacity uh, of a beam and LTB. Um, so we're, we have our three zones. We have zone one is the full plastic moments. That's when you have a beam that's got a lot of bracing, or it could also uh, uh, correspond to co continuously braced beams because if LB is less than or equal to LP, that also would apply if LB is less than or is equal to zero. If LB equals zero, that's a continuously braced beam. Uh, and in that zone, the capacity equals MP, the plastic moment. Um, for zone two and zone three, those are where lateral torsional buckling could occur. Uh, we have an inelastic region and an elastic region. And so we have expressions to handle that for the elastic region. That's the uh, derivation of our differential equation. And for zone two, that's just that linear fit between uh, elastic LTB and the plastic moment. Um, the one wrinkle is CB, our moment gradient modifier, and that will increase our capacity, but up to a certain limit, because the way the code handles uh, uh, flexural capacity, it says that your maximum capacity is MP. Um, so that's our, that's our uh, model that we use to compute capacity. We also have our new design aid. This was what showed up uh, in lecture last time at the very end. So to use table 310, what we do is we divide out the effects of CB. We have to do that because the aid utilizes a CB value of one. Uh, and then once we do that, uh, we go into this chart with uh, x -ax with uh, LB on the x-axis and on the y-axis, we take our maximum bending moment divided by CB. We divide that CB term out. Um, we uh, look up and to the right uh, and we find that shape. So, you know, we did this last time. We locate the point. So we did uh, an LB of 28 feet and an MU over CB of 1162. Again, honestly, just randomly pick those numbers just to because they kind of fit with the, the picture on the page. Um, anything in that shaded region is safe because that means it's got adequate uh, flexural capacity and it can handle a longer unbraced length. We look up and to the right, and that's the section that we use. It's the first bolded row or the solid line section uh, that we see. And we pick those solid line sections because in that region, they are the lightest shape. Um, any questions on that before we get into design? I want to make sure everybody's clear. I'm going to take that as a yes. Okay, so let's talk about the design process. And I want to be clear, the design process for a discreetly braced beam is really the same as the design process for a discreetly, or for a continuously braced beam. Like, they're, they're both the same. Continuously braced design and discreetly braced design are still steel beam design. And so you're still, you know, doing your structural analysis to compute your, your maximum shear and maximum moment. You're still doing a structural analysis problem to compute the required uh, moment of inertia, the required IX. And then you take those values and you pick a trial shape. And then you take that trial shape and you analyze it to make sure that it works. That's the same process. The only thing that's different is because it's discreetly braced and not continuously braced, we're using a different design aid. We're using table 310 instead of table 32. That's really the only difference um, conceptually. There are some differences obviously in the steps and the, the equations that you're using, but the process is the same. So step one, we compute the maximum factored moment, but we also have to find the associated CB value. Now, just like before, we have to assume a beam self weight. Uh, we can assume anything between uh, 50 pounds per foot to 100 pounds per foot. Those are pretty reasonable assumptions for building members. For bridge members, first off, the, the process is going to be a little bit more involved anyways, but bridge uh, girders are gonna be heavier. Um, they just, the moments are higher. Uh, but 50 to 100 pounds per foot are, are pretty reasonable. And I mean, you don't have to take my word for it. Look at all the problems that we've been doing. We've been getting, you know, like W24 by 84, W, you know, uh, 24 by 76. That's between like 50 and 100. Those are pretty reasonable values. Um, we also need a CB value. If possible, use table 3.1 um, because that lists CB values for general, um, for general situations. Um, more often than not, we can use that. Um, uh, if you got really wonky loading, you have to compute it, but that's just something to keep in mind. Um, this note here on the, the right about uh, the self-weight, um, some engineers don't bother with assuming a self-weight during the design phase simply because um, the loads that the beam has to withstand are far greater than the self-weight. I still think you should do it. I think it, it results in 
potentially less iteration down the road. And you got to account for it in the analysis phase anyway, so you might as well just have it set up in your calcs or in your spreadsheet or whatever. Um, and then you compute your required uh, moment of inertia based on your deflection limits. Um, don't forget your set. Um, before, when we left step two, we had two values, a required moment of inertia and a, and a required uh, flexural capacity, required moment. But now we're going to have a third value. We're going to have CB. So uh, at the end of step two, you should at least have these three values. And we've also been going ahead and doing our shear capacity, as well, our, our shear, our VU. So we've had that as well. But for design, we really only need the MU, the IX, and the CB in order to select a shape. Now what we're going to do from there is we're going to go into table 310 uh, and select the most uh, economical trial section. So you go in with LB on the x-axis and MU over CB on the y. You find that point, look up to the right, pick your shape. Now if IX, so, so you end up getting a trial section. Now you'd go take that trial section and you go to check its moment of inertia. If the moment of inertia is too small for that trial shape. What that means is that deflections are largely going to govern your design. And in that case, just abandon um, uh, uh, table 310 altogether and just go to the IX tables, the table 33, and pick your section based on that. Um, as for once you get a trial shape, um, you need to go through and analyze it. The shear capacity will probably not be a problem. Um, uh, the deflection limit Shouldn't be a problem if you've done your math correctly, but I've been teaching this class for a while now and I know that the deflection formulas can be a bit involved and they're ripe for calculator errors. So definitely do it because just calculate the deflection, compare it against your limit uh, and, and you should be fine. Now the moment capacity, the moment capacity is a highly necessary check. Be it with continuously braced beams, it really wasn't all that necessary because what we did is, because LB was zero, we just went to the ZX tables and picked the bold row. And we knew it worked because it had the, um, the adequate uh, uh, flexural capacity because its flexural capacity was MP. Assuming the beam didn't have too much self-weight, we really didn't need to iterate and that was it. But with, with discreetly braced beams, you have got to check the moment capacity. It is highly necessary. And, and the reason why is because a high CB value can generate uh, what I call, or what, what is called like a false positive. So you pick a section in, uh, in those charts, and then you go and analyze it, and you find it doesn't work. And that can happen when you have somewhat high CB values. Um, and we'll kind of discuss where that, uh, where that plays, out, uh, plays out today. Uh, but the video that I, I posted for Monday really digs into that. It's not hard, but, uh, but you'll, you'll understand that a little bit better once we go through the uh, the example today. Um, the only other final point I would mention, and I didn't talk about this on uh, on Wednesday, but uh, it, sometimes with this table 310, the lines kind of like they start to get real vertical. And, and if there's a lot of stuff overlapping, sometimes it's, it's uh, hard to see like what the label is for the line that you're looking at. And I mean, it, it just is what it is. Sometimes the, the aid is kind of difficult to see. Sometimes it's easier to trace upwards to find the section that, that intersects. Um, I'm, I'm just, as somebody who's done this a lot, I've found that sometimes that makes it a little, a little easier to pick the shape that you're looking for. So you can either trace up and to the right or trace upwards, uh, but either one of those methods uh, should work. So that's just, that's just me giving you some advice for, uh, for using the table. Okay, um, uh, sorry. Any questions before we dig into our example for today? I'm gonna take that as a no. Um, so we've got a design example. We are going to design this beam start to finish. Um, the beam is subjected to a dead load of one kip per foot and a live load of three kips per foot. Now the note here says that the dead load shown does not include a beam self weight. So we're going to need to estimate that. Um, and we're going to assume that the beam weighs 100 pounds per foot during the design phase. But we are going to have to add that to the, uh, to the load here. Uh, the bracing is provided only at the end the beam is 24 feet long 
and its LB is also 24 feet because we only have bracing at the ends. Um, we're going to ensure that the beam has a lot or meets a live load deflection limit of L over 360, and that's going to be our, our design. So let me uh, stop the share. The one thing I didn't put on here, uh, maybe I, I should I should remark on this. There is one material parameter that's missing on this problem, and that's FY. I actually didn't tell you what FY is, but W shapes are so commonly available in FY that unless otherwise stated, FY is going to be 50 KSI. So I think that's a that's a reasonable assumption for a W shape. Let me stop the share and share the um, the notebook. Okay. Uh, and again, you know, stop me, turn on your microphone, see if you got any questions. Just uh, don't let me barrel through this stuff. If you've got any questions, let me know. Okay, so we have a discreetly braced beam. Um, we're, we're going to uh, start off with doing our structural analysis. So, um, so I'm going to say compute MU and VU. Uh, I'm going to write a couple of parameters, though, over here on the right, just to make sure that we're able to identify what we need to identify. Um, so we know that L is 24 feet. 24 feet. Hopefully everybody recognizes that because LB is the distance between the braces, so there's only a brace on each end. So, uh, again, if you got questions, let me know. We have a dead load of one kip per foot. And we're going to have a self-weight, so I use w naught for the self-weight, of 0 0.1 kips per foot. And that is assumed. So we're going to go back to that assumption later and see if we need to update our moments or not. Maybe we need to, maybe we don't. Uh, remember, if the beam is heavier than that, we need to update all of our moments. Um, if it's lighter than that, we can just use the MU and VU that the problem gives. If the if the um, uh, if the beam ends up failing and it fails like ever so slightly, that might be a reason to update your MU and your VU if the beam is lighter, because that'll drop your MU and VU just a little bit, and that might be the uh, the ticket. So just something to think about. Um, we have FY of 50 ksi, uh, and uh, we'll just uh, I think that's enough to to get us going. Okay. So um, we have the, uh, so let's start off with uh, the dead load. So we need to compute our dead load moment. So that's going to be WL squared over 8, but I'm going to add the, um, the, uh, the self weight in there as well because it's all going to be factored the same way. So that's going to be 1.1 kips per foot because the WD is 1, W0 is 0.1, times 24 feet squared over 8. And so that's going to be, what is that? 1.1 times 24 squared over 8. Anybody got an answer for me on that? I'm stiffly today. Make sure everybody's awake this Friday morning. There we go. 79.2 foot kips. Okay. And our dead load shear is WDL over 2. So, or sorry, oh, I need to add the self weight. Okay, anybody got an answer on that one? While we're waiting on an answer on that one, I'll go ahead and add this one. All right, 13.2, what's the units on that? There we go. And so 
Same thing, WL squared over eight. So this one is three kips per foot. That one's not bad. Let's see. But you got it right. Okay, and then this is three. Okay, so let's see. Three times 24 squared over eight. And then three times 24 over two. Anybody got answers for this? ML is 216 foot kips. Here, I'll, I won't be so lazy. I'll add the, I'll write it out all the way. And then uh, for the shear, 36 kips. Okay. So therefore, our factored loads. We're taking MU as 1.2 dead plus 1.6 live. VU is 1.2 dead plus 1.6 live. I think by now we can just sort of write that out here. So 1.2. I'm getting um, I'm getting four forty point six four. Am I getting that right? Yep. And then what about for the shear? Can somebody do the shear for me? All right, yeah, 73.44 kips. Okay, and the other thing that we need in step one um, that we might as well go ahead and do now is our moment gradient modifier. So um, we can look that up in table 3-1. Uh, table 3-1 is on page 3-18. Now can somebody look at that table and tell me what is CB going to be for this problem? Maybe what I'll do is, if it's okay, I'll scroll up a bit so that we kind of look at our original problem. It's 1.14. That's right. Does everybody see that? We have a simply supported beam with a uniformly distributed load. So we're going to look at those. Um, let me get back in frame. We're going we to look at these uh, sections here on the bottom. And so that's going to be the ones down here. And we have the bracing at the ends. And so you can see that it reports CB as 1.14. If not, we'd have to go through and chug it out, you know. One of the interesting things about that is C sub B is actually independent of the magnitude of load. In other words, if you have uniformly distributed load, it doesn't matter how much it is because it all ends up getting factored out. It also doesn't matter how long the beam is because you're doing quarter point moments. So if you do, if the beam is 40 foot long, you're doing computing moments every 10 feet. If it's um, 60 foot long, you're computing moments every 15 feet. So the, the span length kind of gets divided out as well. Okay. Um, and so maybe what I'll do is I will circle
Like this was the result of step one were those values. Everybody get so far? Good deal. Okay. So next step is to compute the required moment of inertia. Let me number no let me number that so I'm keeping up with my theme. So the first thing that we need to do is we need to compute our deflection limit. And so that was L over, I believe it was 360. Was that right? Let me see. Yeah, L over 360. So L over 360, so that's 24 feet over 360. But don't forget, we got to put in our unit conversion factor. So 24 times 12 over 360. And that's 0 0.8. Okay. Um, so that means the beam cannot deflect more than point, you know, eight inches. So as for the deflection, the actual maximum deflection, like what is the maximum deflection? Does everybody remember that formula? Remember, we're dealing with a, uh, a simply supported beam with a uniformly distributed load. So what is the formula for the maximum deflection? Remember, the maximum deflection is going to be at mid-span. Let's see if you all remember that. And if you don't remember it, where can you find it? Well, that, that is an accurate statement, or that, that is a true statement. It's not an accurate statement, but it's a true statement. There, 384, there you go. There you go. So, th yeah, that is correct. So, what we're going to do is, um, uh, you know, we're going to set that basically equal to our deflection limits. So I think... By now, we've done this enough that that can be fine. So um, that deflection has to be less than or equal to our limit, right? So what I can then do is I can say that Ix required is 5WL to the fourth over 384E times our our deflection limit. So I'm just, you know, taking it and flipping it. So big old fraction, five times three kip per foot times 24 feet raised to the fourth, right? Don't forget my 1728 conversion factor. There we go. And so Ix required equals um, let's see if you all can beat me. Okay. I've got the answer. Who Who else has it? Nine sixty five. I got a point three, but yeah, nine sixty five point three inches to the fourth. All right. And so that's gonna be our result of of step two. All right, I'm gonna take a sec. I wanna see if anybody has any questions on this before we get into design land.
Okay. This should be largely the same. I mean, we're adding this CB term here, but this shouldn't be any different than anything we've done uh, for the past little bit. So for step three, So we're going to select a trial shape from table 310. Now what we do is we go into table 310 on the x-axis with LB. LB is 24 feet. And we go in on the y-axis with MU max. Hold on. MU max over CB. Now MU max over CB is um, uh, what is it? It's uh, what was our MU max? It was 440.64 foot kips divided by CB. We got to divide our CB effect out so that we can go into the table. So that divided by 1.14 is 386.5. Okay. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to give you all a sec to find that shape if you can. Meanwhile, I've got my manual right here, and I'm going to do a little bit of sleuthing and seeing if I can copy this in here. So you all look. I want you. I want to see if anybody can find the shape while I'm I'm trying to set this up. But remember, what you do is you go into your manual, find that point, look up to the right, and find the first solid shape. So you all go ahead. I want to see if you all can find it. All right, so W21 by 50 seems reasonable. Now, are you picking the solid line segment? And and the other thing I would check is your, your distance because, or what page, what page are you on? Actually, let me see that. What page are you on? No, oh, well, you're on the wrong table. You're on the wrong table. We're going into the chart. We're going into table 310. Yeah, see, if you, I, I, it's funny you say that, I want, because if you picked a W21 by 50, this is actually worth discussing. The 21 by 50 has a plastic moment that probably works. But remember, the capacity is not going to be limited by the plastic moment. It's going to be limited by its LTB capacity because LB is 24. If we were to compute the capacity of the LB uh, 21 by 50, it would probably be way too low. So, While you all are doing that, 18 by 76. I think that's what I'm getting. So here, I'll show you how I'm doing that. Uh, let me see this right here and I'll, I will try and be as neat as possible okay so let's see let's see if this works okay so I'm on page 3-118 um, and so I'm thinking it should look something like this right so what I'm doing is I'm going into the chart I'm going in with an unbraced length of 24 feet, and I'm going in with a moment of 386.5. So that's going to be, I don't know, um, something like that, right? So I'm going to go in, and basically the point I'm looking at is... Like that's the point, right? And so... What I then do is I trace upwards and to the right, and that's the first solid line that I see. And if you look at that, that is a W18 by 76. Does everybody see that? And so this is on page three. Three dash one eighteen.
No, that's fine. That's fine. Yeah. And so yeah, this 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 table is like long. It there's like 20, 30 pages of this table. So you have to flip through. If you look at as you flip this way as as the pages advance, the moments on the y-axis get smaller. So if you're really early in the table, the moments are huge, and so you have to advance forward a little bit. Make sense? Is there is anybody else have any questions about this? Okay. Now what I want you to do is I want you to, okay, so Mr. Blizzard was on table 3-2. Uh, I want you to go to table 3-2 because now before we start doing our analysis, I want to check something, okay? So with table, um, oh. so now let's go to um, ta uh, table 3-2. Let's check IX requirements. We got that IX required was 965.3 inches to the fourth, right? That's what we computed earlier. What is IX for a W18 by 76? What is the actual IX for this trial shape? And I'm doing the W18 by 76 because that's what we picked up here, right? We said try W18 by 76. 1330. So, my question to the class is this. Um, is it worth it to go ahead and check this section to see if it's going to work? Well, now hold on. This is the deflection limit. Remember, there's three different limits. The question is, is it good? Like, is it going to fail deflections? And where you say it seems way over, I'm going to address that later in, in the problem because I want to look at the performance ratios. Nobody's saying anything. Do y'all have any questions? Or am I, am I, am I, com let me ask it this way. Is this, does it look like this beam is going to meet the deflection requirement? Yes or no? Yeah, it will. Yeah, yeah it's got uh, the moment of inertia is bigger than what we need. So this means it's a viable shape. So Okay. So what I'm getting at is now this is a section that is worth analyzing. If if the if this failed, then what I would do is go to table 3-3 three, three and pick a section that worked. Okay. Let's see if we can go through the analysis and see how this is going to shake out at the end. So analyze W18 by 76. Now, let me ask a question. Are we going to need to update our bending moment, our MU and our VU? Are we going to need to update those, or can we use the values from before? Well, 76 seems less than 100, so the beam is lighter, so I don't think you need to change it right now. Exactly. Yeah, that's exactly right. So MU, uh, so here, here's what I'll, I'll, I'll just write it like this. I'll say beam is lighter than initial assumption. Therefore, simply reuse MU and VU. Okay, and so we got an MU of 440.64 
and a VU of like 73 something. Now for the W18 by 76, from table 3-2, I'm gonna need some properties, okay? So first off, what is LP and what is LR? Somebody help me out with that. And again, it's possible this isn't a bold row. It might be, it might not. That is possible. Because again, it's not about what was a bold row. It's about what's the lightest section in that region. Okay, LP is 9.22. LR is what? 27.1. Now, our LB is 24 feet. What does that mean? We're in the linear zone. Yeah, we're in zone two. Now, I'll go ahead and tell you, in the design phase, that is most likely what's going to happen. More often than not, in design land, you're in zone two. So just, just keep that in mind. Now, we're going to need some other properties. We're going to need phi and P. We're going to need phi BF. And while we're at it, let's go ahead and write down the shear capacity. Now the shear capacity, I'll go ahead and write that down. That's 232. Somebody help me out with the other two. What is phi and P? Remember, this isn't a bold row. And that's okay. It's on the bottom of 3-24. Are y'all with? Is is anybody got? Is anybody having a hard time finding this? Nobody else is saying anything. All right. Yeah. Six eleven for FMP. And somebody else for the v, VBF. There we go. All right. Okay, so don't forget also, um, note that we still have that CB term popping up. That's 1.14. We still have that. Okay, so in order to compute the capacity, we've got to compute, um, you know, that linear fit. So that's just that linear interpolation between LP and LR. So 1.14 times 611 minus uh, 12.8 kips times 24 feet minus uh, 9.22 feet. And we're going to compare that against phi and P. So but what is this?
Anybody got an answer for me? All right, 480.87 foot kips. And so, therefore, phi M N is the minimum of CB, you know, what we just computed, or phi M P. So it's the minimum of 480.87 foot kips or 611. So that's pretty straightforward, right? Phi M N. So here I'm gonna I'm gonna scroll down a bit just to give myself some room. So Phi M N is gonna be 480.87. And M U if you remember MU from before, MU is 440. So is our beam good or not? It's good, there you go. Okay, now if you remember, uh, uh, we can compute a performance ratio. And so if you compute the performance ratio divided by 480.87, you get a performance ratio of like 0 0.916, okay? Now that performance ratio is actually higher than, than some of the others. Like for example, if we look at FVVN, FVVN was uh, 232. And VU is, um, I think we had VU computed earlier. VU was 73.44. That is, of course, also okay. And its performance ratio is much lower. It's, um, it's going to be like 0 0.317, okay? So that means that moment is just a much bigger deal than, than shear and deflection. Now, Mr. Uh, Blizzard made a good point. He said, well, what's the deal with the, uh, the deflection? Because he said it seems like it's way too much. Well, it might be way too much on the deflection side. It just may mean that deflection doesn't govern the design. Remember, we had a deflection limit of 0 0.8 inches. If you compare that now with the maximum deflection. So now we have a shape. So now we can compute this. See, we didn't compute this before because we didn't know what IX was. So now we can say 5 times 3 kip per foot times 24 feet to the fourth times 1728 and then 384 times 29,000. Now we have a moment of inertia. Now we've got a moment of inertia of 1330. And when we compute that, we get 0 0.581. So of course it's okay, right? because it's deflecting less than the limit, but our performance ratio is 0 0.726. So one of the things Mr. Blizzard was saying is he looked at the beam and he said it's too heavy. Well, what he was saying is that it looks like we can do a better job on the performance ratio for, for deflection. And that may be, but if we pick a lighter shape, we're going to fail that, right? There are three different limit states, moment, shear, and deflection, and just deflection didn't govern. So on that step four, we were just trying to make sure that the beam wasn't going to fail in deflection. Since it didn't, we know we're good. So what what is the answer? Like, what are we trying to uh, determine? Use a W18 by 76. That's the answer. 
We were trying to pick a beam to safely resist those loads, and we just did. That's the beam. Now I want to see if that makes sense because I want to show you something real quick before we um, before we call it because I want you to I want this to be clear. Is everybody good? Yeah, I got it now. Yeah, the the multiple criteria for a beam. So yeah, that makes sense. Yeah. Now let me show you something real quick. Let me stop this. Share. Here's your homework assignment. Um. The one thing to, to note is here is your beam. Um, your beam has three unbraced segments, um, but I'm doing something to make your life a little easier. So the first thing is I'm letting you use table 3-1 to determine CB. So if you look at this first note, it says the self-weight of the beam may be neglected when you determine CB. So the only other loads are the point loads. So you can use table 3-1 to determine CB for each of those segments. But what I want you to do is look at those three segments and see if you can figure out which one to focus on, okay? Because each of those three segments are going to have different CB values, and so look at each of them and see if you can reason, if you can use some intuition and figure out why we can only, why we only need to consider one versus the other. Does that make sense? Uh it might not now, but uh, when you're going through the assignment, I, th I think it will. All right. I'm going to leave you all to it unless anybody has any questions. We're not going to meet as a class on Monday. We will meet as a class on Wednesday for the final lecture. Only one more week to go, guys. You all are doing great. I will leave you to it. You all have a wonderful weekend. I will see you all on Wednesday. That's all I got.